Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Windhorse Publications podcast. My name is Dama Mega and I'm the publishing director at Windhorse Publications and I am very happy to be able to present today this interview that I did with Bodhidasa who is the author of a book that we're going to be releasing in October this year. The book is called Approaching Enlightenment, a Guidebook to Buddhist Ritual. Um, And I want to actually start with a a short piece that was written by Maitri Siddhi in an endorsement for the book. Maitri Siddhi is a Buddhist teacher based at uh, Taraloka Retreat Center in the UK. Uh, She wrote, in a world where the word ritual is usually prefaced by meaningless, it's a joy to read this insightful and accessible exploration of the power of puja. Bodhidasa explains with clarity, for the skeptic as well as those drawn to puja, what Buddhist ritual is really about and how puja can transform our minds and imbue our lives with meaning and significance. So in this interview, I talk with Bodhidasa about his own practice of ritual and how he came to put um, ritual practice so centrally in his own Buddhist, overall Buddhist practice, his knowledge, his playfulness, uh, what inspires him and what's in this new book that includes a whole lot of uh, information about um, about ritual, ritual objects, ritual spaces, why we do what we do, what symbols mean, how they can affect us, how to ask good questions about ritual. Uh, and also we get to know Bodhidasa himself a little bit. He's, uh, amongst other things, an award-winning teacher at the only Buddhist school in Sydney, Australia. So I hope you enjoy the conversation and the welcome to Bodhidasa. Hello, Bodhidasa. Hello, Dharma Mega. Oh, it's lovely to see you. You're all the way over in Sydney, which, and I'm all the way over here in the UK. So thank you for making the time. I know you've had a really busy day today. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, as a, a person in charge of welfare in a small school, uh, I have a lot of meetings with kids and I've had a number today. So I've um, been able to help them, I hope. Hmm. We're uh, here today to talk about your book that will come out in October this year, Approaching Enlightenment. Um, so it'll be published by Windhorse Publications and it'll be available in from the US and UK and in Australia as well, which is very exciting for us. Um, <laughs> so I, today I just want to find out a little bit more about you and your connection with ritual and this process that you've been in in writing a book. The book is about ritual. But why don't we start with um, just a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do with your life when you're not writing books. (laughs) How far do you want to go? Do you want star signs? Do you want uh, (laughs) Myers-Briggs? Do you want a neogram? (laughs) Do you want to know what Hogwarts house I'm in? (laughs) Yes, let's start with the Hogwarts house. Well, I'm a Slytherin. Are you now? Interesting. Yes, yes, apparently. Every test I've done, I'm I'm, I'm a Slytherin, which at this point many of the people listening may be turning off. <laughs> it certainly tells us a few things, one of which is that you really like, um, well, games, gaming, popular culture, uh, literature, wizardry. Uh, yeah, look, um, I... I suppose, uh, I, I, look, I'll come out of the closet. I am a geek. Uh, mm-hmm. I am a geek. There you go. I'm out and proud. I am a geek. Uh, and it's not been an easy path being a geek uh, or a nerd or whatever those sort of, sort of things are. Um, but I also uh, did my <laughs> undergraduate degree uh, and wrote my honours thesis on the 1798, I think, edition of the Lyrical Ballads by Wordsworth and you know, so I, I I can I can walk in two worlds, if you like. I can explore the poetry of Mary Oliver, and I can go into W. B. Yeats, and I can talk about Wordsworth and Shakespeare, and because I teach these things as well. But I, I'm also really happy with you know Gandalf and Yoda mm-hmm. and 
<laughs> Doctor Strange from the Marvel Universe. I, I, I can really connect with both of these sorts of things and um, it, I'm getting more comfortable being in both of those worlds. Hmm. So you're a literary wizard who's also a Buddhist. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's that's exactly right. Uh, I'm I'm a literary wizard. Um, I'm, no, in all seriousness, though, I think I uh, my kind of spiritual awakening uh, happened when I was 16, and I accidentally turned on uh, and watched Joseph Campbell being interviewed, hmm. and this is what introduced me to the idea of archetypes. Mm. Uh, and Joseph Campbell, uh, the great mythologist and, and writer, he introduced me to the the wizard, the the sage, the wise archetype, and it was like that's that's who I want to be. That's mm. that's the kind of person that I want to be. That that person who helps and guides and has n- some kind of um, knowledge that they put to the service of a community. That that hooked me in such a powerful way. And I, I suppose my life's been about finding the outfit for the the right outfit for that archetype to live out more fully and with more uh, authenticity. Mm. Mm. And the Dharma, the Buddhist life, uh, has has been the context for that, and you're certainly in the your adult life. Uh, not originally. Um, mm. But it certainly became the the truest and uh, most authentic uh, representation of that for me. Um, mm. I talk about this a little in the book. Uh, that for me, m- I actually practice as a ritual magician um, mm. prior to being a Buddhist, and I, and ritual magician, I don't mean like stage magician kind of mm. thing. I suppose a little bit more. Uh, more like a pagan, I suppose, be a way to describe it. But it never sat fully truthfully uh, with me. But when I became a Buddhist, I did the thing that many early Buddhists do. Um, by early Buddhists, I mean when they're starting out in their mm. career. I mm. gave away everything. Mm. I cut it all out of my life um, because, you know, I made a decision that that stuff is not Buddhist. That stuff is kind of wrong. It's I made a very immature decision. Uh, and I noticed life becoming very colourless. Hmm. Yeah. So do you mean by that that you thought to be a Buddhist was a, a sort of ascetic path that you needed to be still and possibly personalityless? Uh I wouldn't be so bold as to say personalityless, but I certainly felt that it was wrong to feel emotions. Mm. I certainly felt mm. that it was wrong to be um, drawn to things that one had to mm. go inwards. Uh, mm. It was wrong to um, it, it was wrong to do anything outer. Mm. That was certainly the that was certainly the kind of vibe that I got in my early Buddhist life, and this was prior to me encountering Tree Ratna. Mm. Um, and I, life became just very austere and tight. Mm. And I just, I just thought this was my conditioning fighting against the new way of being. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was really hard. Um, and I recall vividly, uh, the point where this changed and it was actually a book that Sangharachita wrote <laughs> And uh, I met with him uh, a couple of years later to thank him for this book, uh, mm. and that was uh, Creative Symbols of Tantric Buddhism. Mm. Classic. Classic. And it's a profound text for me at least and mm. for many others, I imagine. And I remember saying to him uh, with you know huge gratitude, I said, this was Dorothy opening up the door Mm. from sepia uh, Kansas Mm. into the luminous colour of Munchkin land Mm. because I realised that the Buddhist path that I need to practice, that I need to walk, is not everyone's. I I appreciate that. But I need 
life and colour and joy and symbol and diversity, mm -hmm. uh, not a kind of uniform austerity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just needed to thank him personally for that. Mm -hmm. So for those people who will be listening to this who haven't yet uh, read the book or seen any of it, I think one of the things that is so delightful, this is certainly what delighted me and us when I first read it, was it's all in there in a very integrated way, a very um, deep and thorough traditional kind of Dharmic Buddhist understanding uh, of Dharma, of the of the fetters, of how we work with our mental states, and then also this incredibly rich uh, language and this very thoughtful approach to ritual, to symbols, to imagination. Uh, so, you know, it's all, it's all in the book, uh, the, you know, the form, <laughs> the form and the message are united in the book in a way that uh, is very delightful to read. So I hope people really enjoy reading it. Hmm. And it, it's so lovely to hear of the sort of integration for you that happened mm. in terms of the sort mm. of prior interest and then this meeting the Dharma or being met by the Dharma in that and, and Sankarakshita's mm. approach to that. Um, mm. But you know, so much of Buddhism, you, you make this point in the book, so much of Buddhism today that's oriented towards English-speaking readers or people who've converted to Buddhism, um, the kind of people who might be listening to this, is very secular and has prioritized uh, mindfulness, meditation, mm. ethics. Um, mm. So I suppose the question is sort of both what is Buddhist ritual? And mm. why do we need it? I think ritual opens you up to something which is inconvenient, particularly to a, a, a more rational, in, in inverted commas, uh, Western mindset. And that is that, is there more than this? Is there mm. more than me? Mm. Is there more than my mental state? And I think ritual, particularly if you look at, say, the uh, the sevenfold puja or the seven limb prayer that comes from the early early traditions and the sort of middle traditions. These are all pointing you towards something that is uh, transpersonal or supra personal, mm. uh, and it's encouraging you not to necessarily believe in some higher power. I don't think that that's helpful, but it's asking you to shift your boundaries, to open yourself up to the possibility that there's more than you and that there's more in other people. Mm -hmm. And ritual opens you up to the potential in yourself to go beyond your limits, to go beyond the limits you impose upon other people and to wish for others' limits to become boundless. And, and that's why I find it so transformative because it's not about me. Mm. 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 So if we come back to the title of your book, Approaching Enlightenment, in a mm. way, th there's a journey in that, isn't there? There is something about um, moving beyond or moving towards uh, something which, as you say, is a broader horizon than our usual <laughs> bag of skin and self-interest uh, collection. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, even even if you if you're familiar with the text of the sevenfold puja, if you if you if you're familiar with its structure or, or a, a seven limbed prayer or seven lined prayer, if you're in a tradition that practices that, you start with on one level, you start with material things. You start with the material the mundane, you make the physical offerings, you have candles, you have light, lights, you have food and earthly things. Mm. Uh, of course, they have multiple layers of meaning, which, of course, we go into in the book. So we start with there and then the end, the end of, say, the sevenfold puja, we are evoking these suprapersonal qualities that are not owned by individual entities that exist within the potential of human beings and other beings. And then we release that into peace. So we go mm. beyond the material and we move into something which is far beyond ourselves. 
And I, I just find this profoundly beautiful and profoundly transformative. Mm. So often, in my experience anyway, rituals are sort of performed now and then in a collective space. Mm. Um, but what you do in this book is obviously you address that and you address, as you say, these many layers of symbol and meaning. Uh, but you also talk about um, an individual relationship with ritual that doesn't just have to take place on these occasions. You can weave ritual, these elements, or this journeying, mm. this moving beyond yourself uh, in through your day. Um, and mm. I know that that's something you do. I wonder if you want to <laughs> say something about that. Yeah. Oh, look, thank you for asking that. Um, to dial it back to the beginning, uh, I talked about my my job as a director of welfare and a teacher in a school, and you know, I'm up at 5.30 working with my mental states uh, and have to be on a train early, and then I work late, and then I come home late. And because it's a Buddhist school, it's an aspect of my practice. But the thing that I would most want to be doing <laughs> in the mornings is not meditating but doing ritual. And, you know, it's meaningless to kind of pump through a puja in the morning. Know, mm -hmm. ring the bells and light the candles and whoop, out the door. So instead, um, the puja for me is something that I bookend my day with. I'd like, so at the beginning of my day, <laughs> I was doing it this morning, I'm walking out the door and mentally as I walk out the door of the house, I recite the opening verses. And as I'm walking down the street, I'm contemplating to myself what are the offerings that I can give other people today? I don't mean literally with mandarava, blue lotus and jasmine, to quote the, the puja, but what actions can I do will be fragrant and mm. of value to other people? Um, what illumination can I give to other people? Um, and then I recite uh, a mantra before I get on the train. Uh, usually in my head. <laughs> if I didn't, could it would be awkward be, otherwise. <laughs> it, it could be slightly embarrassing. Um, I will recite the the refuges and precepts uh, for myself in the train, uh, and then I will live out my day. And then on the when I get on the train at the end of the day, it's an opportunity for me to do an inventory of the my precepts and to reflect mm -hmm. on which ones. I may not have um, polished as well as I should have, uh, and I'll complete the the puja on the way home. Uh, at least up until say the the end, the uh, transference of merit. And for me, uh, sometimes I might do that as part of a course I might be teaching or a class I might be teaching at the Buddha Center. Uh, and what I like to do when I hit the pillow is I like to recite the concluding mantras. So as I go to sleep, I uh, release into sleep, hopefully um, being inspired by the what those the qualities and energies of the concluding mantras. Mm. Uh, for me, it's a way of living that story mm. and embedding it meaningfully in what I do. I don't know mm. if that makes sense. Mm. It makes sense to me. I think, um, you know, one of the questions I have is about how ritual – practically like actually relates to for example you know the meditation working with mental states and ethics and mm. i was particularly struck in how you were speaking now about the ethical dimension of that you take refuge you do the precepts which obviously are the sort of training principles in the ethics that mm. we uh, uphold and then there's confession uh, there's rejoicing in merit those, those are three elements of the sevenfold puja. Um, mm. And as you say, that's, uh, you know, you've created a way of doing reflection in, in that process. I think it is. And I think at the end of the day, um, particularly maybe just in my profession, but maybe it's in other people's, that mm -hmm. you can be tired and you can be full of gripes and you can only see the, the faults of the day and the faults in yourself and the faults in other people. And uh, I think the rejoicing in merit is particularly useful for me as I have quite a critical mind, self-critical and other critical mind. 
that capacity just to recite, but not just to recite. Uh, I think for me it's a process of when I, you know, to quote the to quote that section of the puja, the rejoicing in merits, I rejoice with delight in the good done by all beings. And then I will stop myself and I will reflect and try and recall to mind the good that I saw other people do mm. and then rest in that response. Mm. Like the way we do a call and response, like, so we, like the person leading a puja will say, I rejoice with delight in the good done by all beings and people then say that. I, I am doing the call and response for myself. Mm. Calling is reaching out to find where is the good done by all beings that I experience today and then resting in that response. Mm. Mm. Otherwise, it's just meaningless recitation or maybe not meaningless recitation. That's not fair to say. I think it's even to recite the puja has value. Mm. But if you don't rest in it mm. and, as you say, reflect, if you don't, then um, it probably do it doesn't have the potential for transform transformation and change. Mm. Mm. So it's a sort of mudita experience as well, isn't it? Isn't this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, the picture is that. It is so filled with... It is filled with the Brahma Viharas. It's filled with loving kindness. It's filled with compassion, mudita. Mm. I suppose the equanimity that's required is not to be overthrown by your own uh, remorse mm. or your own failings mm. uh, or to be over, over uh, what's what I'm looking for, thrown off by uh, any kind of uh, ecstasy or joy you might feel, but be able to sit with that with a, appreciative position. Mm. Mm. But, yeah, the Brahma Viharas are present in it. Mm. I'm really struck by, um, in, in the book and in our conversations over the time we've been working together around the book, of these uh, two things. So we're in a sort of secular society and mm. then there's this golden, rich Deep effect, affecting thing for those uh, those people who uh, experience ritual in this way. It's like a, a there's a it's a very rich field, a sort of language of symbol of imagination. It's a bit like working in this dream world as well, isn't it? In the sense of um, in the sense of you don't control you don't control the, the responses that are or the evocations that that come up as you're doing puja. But so there's a sort of cultural tension there. Um, and then even in the Buddhist world, there's a bit of a cultural tension around ritual, isn't there? You know, the, a, a reliance on rites and rituals is one of the fetters. Um, so, you know, constantly in the book, you're talking about you need enough knowledge to know what you're doing. You don't want to be just like ha having a sort of fantasy experience. You, you need to know what you're doing enough to be um, present in it, and you you don't want to be doing it in a way that's rote. Um, I wonder if you can yeah. talk a little bit about about sort of navigating your way or helping other people navigate their way through this process of knowing enough to know what you're doing, and um, and in a way not sort of just exoticizing this dimension of Buddhism. I, I'm really glad you used the word exoticizing. I, I think my early experience and an experience of a, of observing other people is that there is this sense of um, a kind of tourism that you're doing something exotic, you're doing something esoteric, mysterious, and exotic. And uh, I think that that may well be an enjoyable first taste what it feels like to engage emotionally and intellectually with curiosity, um, but it doesn't last. It's like a, it's a spiritual happy meal. <laughs> it <laughs> tastes great at the time, but it's not so sustaining long term. Um, it is actually was, it was a real challenge to try and present the ideas in a way that I don't inherently experience. So it was a case of here is my academic training. 
Mm. Here is my training and my training as an educator, which kind of points me in a direction with the material. But if I follow it fully, my experience of ritual and devotion becomes tight, Mm. boxed in, and it becomes a case of um, this thing means that. Mm. It becomes very literal. Um, So it was a case of using my skills to point me in a direction and then let go. Mm. Uh, I had to let go. I had to take the the research and the thinking to a certain point and then I had to practice it mm. and I had to reflect on it and then try and make that an open invitation rather than a, a dictionary definition style approach. Mm. And I hope to some extent um, this is successful. Um, I, I'll tell you that the one of the one of the struggles I've had around this is um, people's resistance to the idea that you have to th- we don't have to that you are invited to think about ritual mm. that you are to find out more about it that you're going to use your intellect to any extent in this domain. It's almost as if bringing your intellectual aspect of yourself, your rational reasoning aspect into this domain is somehow sullying it Hmm. or it's somehow uh, inappropriate or it's somehow um, trying to tether a cloud or something. And uh, I, I, I want to challenge that. Uh, and I think mm. it it undermines the potential if you just think it's all going to happen with the you know, the the veil will be revealed and and if you are one of the uh, the special ones who who is opened into this world then you will experience something. I um I want to challenge that. Mm. Mm. I really want to challenge it. And yeah, I hope I that doesn't offend anybody. <laughs> Oh, I think there's a there's a um, an understanding of the human being that we've inherited that contrasts, say, feelings and and rationality, um, and this is one of the domains where maybe that's particularly heightened. Um, but you do an intelligent job of talking about the nature of ritual in the book. You know, it it is it is um, it is integrated. Maybe that's the word we're aiming for, isn't it? Like a, part of what our job is to, is to integrate. You know, you, you spoke yourself of of this process of integrating a kind of Buddhism and a magic and wizardry, or experiencing that integration, mm. um, and the sort of it doesn't knowledge come across as human... sorry to interrupt you there. Mm. It doesn't come across as cold and academic, does it? No, not at all. Not at all. It comes across as quite playful, actually, which I think is a good way in. What makes it playful? I'm I'm curious. Well, your own love of, uh, so for example, when you get to this idea of of meaning and symbols and you're explaining that, we go straight into comics, for example, and we have comic strips (laughs) in there, which which have this nice sort of banter in them as a way of uh, giving an example of what you mean by layering of meanings. So that's an example of playfulness, I think. Oh, I'm so glad because I I really didn't want the book to be um, <laughs> very very oh, what's the word I use uh, po faced. I didn't want it to be very mm. academic or very po faced. Mm. I wanted it mm. I wanted it to feel a bit like we were hanging out together mm. and um, I was being <laughs> very obsessive about what really mattered in my spiritual life and I hoped that others would feel a connection with that somehow. Um, with yeah. your geeking okay. out around ritual, fantastic. I, 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 you know what, it's, as I said, I'm going to be proud about it. Mm. I, I, it's not easy for me to do. Uh, mm. I want to be proud to be a ritualist. Mm. I want to be proud mm. to be a Buddhist wizard. And that doesn't mean I have to wear a pointy hat, though I actually do have several pointy hats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I, 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 yeah, gosh, there's such potential in this area. Hmm. So maybe just to say to, to, to those people who are listening to this, the, the book uh, 
gives sort of starts at the beginning in the sense that it gives a lot of grounding information, ways of thinking about thinking about things, some information mm. about the kinds of symbols and the contexts and the shrine rooms and how to ask questions. And it also, um, I think, you know, whether you're completely skeptical, like don't want to go anywhere near it, or whether you have a natural affinity for it, I think there's a really strong knowledge base in it. And I think you also give a bit of a flavor of the kinds of fruits uh, that are, that come out of a ritual practice. So even if you've been drawn to ritual, um, drawn to doing pujas and mantras and uh, love the symbolism and color and all of the meanings mm -hmm. of that and archetypes, um, there's there's a lot of richness in that as well. I wanted to ask you about how you came to write a book about it. It's, it's all very well kind of using this, being in this practice yourself or, um, mm. and communicating it by your enthusiasm. But why, why and how a book? Well, look, there's, um, there's a number of uh, cases of joining the dots. Um, and some of those dots uh, are quite painful. Some of them are quite mm. painful dots. Mm. Uh, I don't know if we want to go into all of those, um, maybe a couple. But some of them are um, – it, it, it just felt for me that there was a space. There was a space there that I had a feeling that uh, it was like a sacred cow. You couldn't You couldn't do anything with it. You weren't allowed to talk about it. You weren't allowed to apply rationality. You weren't allowed to apply research. And it was this, and and I, and for some reason, maybe it's because of my training in English and history, I, 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 when someone says or avoids something, I want to go there. Mm. I want to go into that space that's being avoided. I want to ask the questions. Um, so on one level, I think there was a, um, what's the what's the expression? So there's a bloody mindedness in it, in a sense. Like, <laughs> what do you mean we can't talk about ritual in this way? What, what do you mean? What do we mean we can't? Um, so there was that. Um, there was a part of it for me on a personal level that I was, in a sense, trying to affirm something I felt so deeply to be true. And I needed to externalize that. I needed to communicate it in in a in a way that was um, validating. Mm. Uh, and and this is probably where we start moving into the kind of difficult areas. Um, so there were a number of times when uh, people would say to me, uh, "Well, you know." Puja is it's it's you know it's not really you know it's it, it's it's Buddhist right and it'd be very downplayed and I'd be thinking that's not what I experience the way you're talking about this I experience mm -hmm. something I I go into I experience often dhyana in puja mm -hmm. I, I have these higher states of consciousness and and you're saying that it's not as valid as say meditation or and that just really bothered me and once mm -hmm. uh, someone said to me that. Uh, ritual and devotion, and, and, and a kind of trigger warning here, um, ritual and devotion was something that was best for the women. Mm. And um, that really, I found that really painful mm. for a number of reasons, um, which I hope your listeners are sensitive to, um, not least of which being that I'm not a woman. And also um, what is that saying about that person's perception of what it means to be a woman? Um, but you, but the sort of implication is that it's a feminine activity and like, you know, men men do other things in yeah, their practice. And, I have a yeah, and I, the more robust things like, you know, mm -hmm. opinions and mm -hmm. what's right and wrong and that kind of I kind of think maybe that's what they meant, or, or maybe they just thought I was effeminate. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and so it got coil, it got really painfully caught up in my own perceptions of what is you know, masculine and you know, being a gay man myself. You know, what is the statement that they're making, and you know, lots of propuncture around that. And I was like, no, you know what? I could sit here with resentment 
and you know a sense of moral outrage at these kind of remarks and and well because the world needs more of those two things in it doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> the world needs more resentment and moral outrage. So instead, how about I do something with that energy? Hmm. How about I say, you know what? Okay, well, here's another perspective on this. And is that when you started offering courses? Yeah. Yeah, hmm. that's when I started offering courses. In fact, another slightly more amusing, not amusing, slightly more mundane point was um, uh, we have a I suppose it's a tradition that when you enter a shrine room, you uh, you bow, mm. uh, you bow in the shrine room. And I remember a, a, an order member doing that once. I was watching an order member in our tradition doing it, and they they hadn't finished their bow, and they were already talking to the next to the person that was next to them uh, about something that was not to do with shrine room activity. I think it was a political thing they were discussing. Mm. And it really stuck me with me. Mm. What exactly were they bowing to? Now, of course, I, I don't have the capacity to know their internal mental states. So I'm not judging them. But from the outside, I was just very curious about that. Very curious about how is this a wholehearted experience for them? Is this a real opportunity for reverence and devotion mm. and gratitude. Maybe that was how they showed that. I just wanted to know mm. more about that experience mm. and could we communicate that to others? Mm. Mm. So the the course that you started offering at the Sydney Buddhist mm. Centre has in a way given a couple of generations of uh, course attendees um, the, the information and the context and the possibility of practicing and then reflecting on what you're doing in practice such that they have the knowledge and the opportunity to do it wholeheartedly. I That's certainly the intention. Uh, mm. I think I've run the course now five times, um, mm. five, six times maybe. And uh, the thing that people m have repeatedly commented on about it is that they felt they they were in a safe space to ask the questions that they were too afraid to ask. Mm. And I was really struck by the use of the word afraid. Mm. Sometimes I would say embarrassed, mm. um, but sometimes I would say afraid. And it's like, why are you afraid to ask why we take our shoes off? Mm. Um, why, why are you afraid to know why we have a Buddha on a shrine? Mm. Oh, I'm, I don't come here for that. I don't come here for Buddhas on shrines. I come here for something else. Okay, mm. let's mm. see if we can connect all those things. Mm. As in connect meditation, connect mindfulness, connect going beyond, connect insight. Yeah, and mm. I hope the book kind of does that. I, mm. I hope it kind of smooths the cracks or joins mm. the dots. Uh, mm. I mean, the one of the things I, I really was so grateful for was uh, one of the people who uh, assisted me uh, on the course a couple of times now, uh, a woman called Callista. Mm -hmm. And her story I found just very profoundly moving. And uh, she, was very, uh, she was very generous in allowing me to uh, write uh, and share her story with Puja mm -hmm. and her story with devotion which came from complete scepticism and purely mind, rational, secular mindfulness, I went through a really transformative process and, uh, and that was through her questioning. Hmm. You know, it had nothing to do with any kind of wizardry I may have engaged in. It was through providing a space for her to ask questions hmm. Um, hmm. so that she had the confidence to engage wholeheartedly with what we were doing. Hmm. Right. Mm. So just a last question before we wrap up, mm. which is what what um, what do you hope for for your book when it's released and kind of what kind of effect are you hoping that the book will have? That's a really good question. Um, I wonder if any author 
of any book uh, really considers this. Um, do you know what? I, I think the thing that would tell me that it was successful and that it had communicated something of meaning would be if 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 shrines didn't have dead flowers on them, unless it was intentional dead flowers, um, that they weren't used as places to store teacups, um, that uh, there would be an air of, um, there'd be a different attitude when people entered shrine rooms. Um, but I suppose uh, that's all a bit intangible uh, in a way. I, I think the thing that would matter most is if when people talked about puja, I didn't hear the same rope things repeated, mm. which are things like, oh, it's a series of moods. Uh, if you don't engage with it, you can enjoy it as an experience of like theatre. Not to bemoan theatre but or, or to decry theatre, but... Um, if if people spoke about puja as being um, having a legitimacy mm. uh, and not just being for the especially initiated ones, and if people felt free to ask the questions mm. that um, they were too afraid to ask, mm. that that would matter. That would actually that would matter most to me if people felt confident to ask about it. Uh, mm. and to uh, share their experience of it. Mm. Probably that would matter more than whether the shrines used to put teacups on or water <laughs> or, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. I suppose I hadn't thought about it in that sense of if what do I hope for it. Okay. Ask me that question another time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll do. <laughs> um, some, uh, I mean, the, the the root texts and the forms of the puja that you're using as examples mm. in this book come from the Tri Ratna Buddhist community um, mm. kind of puja book and the wording. Um, so in a way, that's a, a kind of a main audience for your book. But other mm. people who are in who are interested in Buddhism or who see ritual or who are encountering kind of Buddha figures and ritual objects, mm. um, this is also a book that will give some basic information and possibly will hopefully open up a few doors um, that mm. people can explore for themselves. The this 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 realm and this form of practice uh, well i hope that the the ways in which i encourage people to look at and connect with both uh, buddha images and with symbols i hope that that is universal it's not specifically within the domain of you know, a puja mm -hmm. or ritual but the capacity mm -hmm. to look and to consider layers mm -hmm. rather than to say this is that and mm -hmm. leave it there if people yeah. can do that, I think it activates the potential uh, both within mm -hmm. yourself and in the acts themselves to be more than just the theatre yeah. or more than just moods or, or more than just a devotional practice, which is you know, the other phrase that gets used. I think um, not to you know, not to poo-poo those, not to demean them, but uh, they are part, they're one facet, although those are individual facets mm -hmm. of where puja can take you. Mm -hmm. And and what I'm hearing with that is a sort of an a, approach to receptivity and opening mm. that uh, comes mm. through those things that you're talking about through recitation, through looking, through being responsive to those layers of symbolic meaning. That's the mm. that's the doorway, isn't it? That's the, the door opens not just so that you can you can walk through it, but that something else can 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 come in to the room with you. Exactly right. And the door has to open and there's space for you. You know, you don't just open the door and charge through. You have to open the mm. door and then go into that space. Mm. Um, and I, and that's a, I hope that the book allows people space, uh, particularly through the sections in each chapter where you're asked to engage in a, an action. Mm. Mm. Um, it isn't just, you know, reading. You, there's things we are invited to do in every chapter. I hope that they are an opportunity for people to you know go through that door, test things out for themselves, question mm. before they move on.
with the mm. book. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you very I am much, Rudy Dyson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank delighted. you for your time and yeah, the, the, all of the all of the um, uh, well, your own knowledge and your own creativity and communicating that will come forth in this book. I really, I'm really glad you wrote it. <laughs> I am very happy that I wrote it too because it, it mm. I feel whole mm. in a way that I haven't for a long time. So sadu. thank you. Mm. Sadu, 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 sadu. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I hope you have a really good rest of the evening and go well. And we will see you at book launches and possibly Yay. at centres and look out for the book near you. In fact, I have people are wanting my, me already. I've got dates. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So for those of you who will, um, if you look on Wendhorst Publications website, you will find the book. I'll put some links uh, below this podcast. And um, when the time comes, which will probably be early in 2025, Body Dustin will be in the UK, I believe, for uh, traveling around some centers. There you go. So Mm -hmm. there will be possibilities to meet you in person and to practice together in a shrine room. I would be delighted. Wonderful. Thank you, and go well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wintour's Publications is part of the Tree Ratna Buddhist community, and this podcast is sponsored by Future Dharma Fund, a Buddhist fundraising charity which helps fund Dharma projects across the world, including ours. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider donating to them to help them fund current and future projects like ours. You can find out more about Wintour's publications by going to our website.